Hello. Hello. I uh, just transferred a host over to you, and I think you're all set. Did you have any questions before I jump off? Nah, everything's going smoothly so far. I should be good. Okay, awesome. Well, best of luck. You too. Have a good one. Too. Bye. Bye. Hi, Matt. Is your last name Richardson? Matt? Yep, I'm here. Okay. Hey there. Hey. How's it going? I wanted to make sure you were Matt Richardson. Are you one of the speakers, right? Yes, I am. Okay, I'll go ahead and make you co-host then. I don't have anything to like, oh. <laughs> oh, no, it's okay. I just wanted to verify you. Are. You can go back on mute or you can hide your camera if you want. I'm the tech moderator. So all I'm pretty much doing is making sure all of you all have the permissions that you need. And if you all okay. need holes or breakout rooms, I'm supposed to help with that, though I'm totally new to it. So if it takes me a second, then that's why. But yeah, you can go back on mute. You can turn off your camera. You're good to go. Okay. I look, let's look at another panelist here. Okay, cool. I'm gonna, um, you can let them in too. Like if you recognize them, That'll help me out a lot because I'm like referring to a list and going back and forth. Okay, here we go. Hello, Dr. Curry. You co-host. Perfect. Isabel. Oh, you you're on mute. Too. Yeah, there we go. Hey. There we go. Mm. I was about to say, thank you for coming, everyone. Um, I just got word that Mixon is not going to be able to make it uh, because they did get in a little fender bender. Oh, no. Yeah, they seem to be OK other than being shooken up. But um, I'm glad that everyone was able to make it, at least in terms of getting on the Zoom. So. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone has anything that they would like to share on their screen. It's really going to be conversational between everybody in the audience and everybody in the panel. So nothing really um, that I would say needs to be uh, super polished or super professional, but yeah, if anyone needs to share their screen or, screen or would like to share their screen, um, I think that the capacity is there. Yeah. So. All right. And then we are still waiting on who. So Josh Hello. is not going to be able to make it because um, their partner got COVID. So we have a lot of folks who dropped in and then folks who are coming uh, in as well. Um, we have Donna coming in, we have Zane coming in. Okay, so no Josh and no Amanda. Yes. Uh, so. We're Maybe. waiting for Zane. Zane, no, Zane's not here just yet. Yes, uh, Zane, Kirby, and then Donna, um, who was a late registrant. Okay. Yeah. Keep an eye out. It's still really early, mm -hmm. so they'll probably swing in anytime. Yeah. Isabel, am, am I coming through clearly? Yes. Thank Excellent. you for coming in. Thank you for coming, especially. No, not a problem. Especially because I know it's it's quite late over there in the UK. <laughs> yeah, it oh, is. Wow. Yes, yes. How's everyone doing? Good. I heard you were traveling. I hope that, you know, travels I was. were. Where in the UK are you? Uh, I'm in Scotland. I'm in Edinburgh. Oh, okay, okay. Yes, yes. Yeah, I just got back from uh, Belfast yesterday, or late last night, so. Hmm. I can't wait till I can travel. Oh, it's great. Yeah. Are, do you have any places you want to go or? Um, my priority is Africa and Asia, like countries okay. out there. The first experience I ever had traveling was actually through study abroad. I went to Tokyo, but that was like mm -hmm. spring 2020. So COVID Hello, sent me back home. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it was the first time I've ever even been on a plane. So it was a 
Oh, really? That's a, that's a that's a hell of a first experience. No, no, it was terrifying, but I got through. <laughs> Hi, Kirk. Hey, well, yeah. I don't know if it's more appropriate to use your last name or not, like, uh, or whatever but hi kirby <laughs> what's up no it's sis kirby okay I, i'm newly minted i i became dr kirby lynch in december 2021 oh, yes wow. yeah, so i i still get used to you know be like oh yeah i'm dr lynch <laughs> but yeah, i'm kirby. meeting a lot of like doctors and future doctors at this conference i actually don't i'm not a political science major i don't even go to the university that you know like a friend of mine went to the university whose professor is like helping host this event and we were just having a conversation and she's like hey we need like help you know moderating and i was just like oh okay i'll just be here but i don't know much about well it helps me a lot because i'm learning a lot about the studies that you all are doing and the research that you're taking and I'm like lurking in the background, like <laughs> learning as much yeah. as I can. So that's well, let me ask you, what, what's your what's your uh, area of study? Oh, I graduated last year with a um, bachelor's degree in marketing, and I decided okay. to pursue the advertising route. So even now, I'm finalizing my creative portfolio, and I've gotten the chance to kind of work alongside, you know, a lot of creative execs at like Apple or um, people who do really cool things. And yeah, so everything. that's very political science. You can be a campaign. That's where I'm at. Yeah. When you think about <laughs> communications and all that it entails, advertising is just such a, it's like when you think of it normally, you think of like entertainment and just commercials and stuff, but it's hugely political. It's the, it laid the groundwork for so many of what people associate and like see in terms of everything that, you know, we interact with. Mm hmm oh well great to meet you great and also great to be reunited with you dr richardson i interviewed you like so long ago i'm one of paola's students um, oh okay yeah yeah you know i'm in your lineage and everything <laughs> excellent so, uh, i feel honored to be on this panel oh. also dr curry oh, oh my god hello i've hello. been How are you? your work too oh, holding the oh, line thank you so much Very thank bold. you so much So yeah appreciate this panel well you know i try i think uh i think the gray hair has settled me some though <laughs> <laughs> it'd be like that that the life of the mind you know it really it really is and uh europe is a very very different uh academic environment than the united states so. mm -hmm. i can imagine okay that's probably a whole nother description <laughs> like so curious about like even just different culture shock opportunities and how different things are and oh, it's things. very very different yeah um blackness doesn't translate the same way here uh i think they're trying to move towards developing a race consciousness but it's, mm -hmm. it's certainly not one that's given or that you could presume right. you know um but the and the academic culture here especially when you teach at a, a russell group or what they call red brick institutions like ancient universities uh is so elitist. <laughs> it's, it, it makes Ivy Leagues look like liberal arts colleges. It's crazy, I, the, the class structure of the society. Uh, so it's been, it's been education. That's fascinating. Yeah. By the way, we technically don't start till 315. So if there are any people who've been admitted and they're like, hey, what's going on? Just give it a few minutes. Um, I'm trying to hold off on like letting, if you're not a speaker in until like 3.15, just so um, all the speakers can have the chance to regroup. But we've just been chatting it up. So I know y'all mics work, like y'all cameras look good. Like, <laughs> you know, so yeah. Just like an FYI to anyone who's here early. As a panelist, will we have like in case there's opportunity uh, screen share access? Yeah. Yes. Um. Any yeah. Any panelists should be come should be co-host now, so you all will be able to see the waiting room. You'll be able to share your screen. Um. I'm gonna keep an eye on like if people do start to filter in, even once everyone starts talking, I'll let them in. If you all need breakout rooms, polls, I'll help out with that on the back end. But for the most part, everything's been you know pretty straightforward. Cool, cool, cool. Thank you. You're welcome.
So I see Dana is in and then Professor Snorton is in as well. Okay. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. How are you? Good. Thank you. How is everyone today? Good. Good. I'm blessed. Do you all like know each other? Like in terms of I'm a fan, some fans of everybody. Okay. I'm fans of everyone too. And then Donna and I were in um, a seminar with Tiffany. Perfect. So we know each other. We are still waiting on Zane, but we have two minutes about. Um, uh, is it okay to admit the Molly Bright Brighton or Britain? I mean, you might. Or did you want to wait till nine fifteen? The goal was to wait, but oh, okay. I mean, everyone else is here. They can come. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, yeah. And we were supposed to be also streaming on the Encope's Facebook page, but I don't know if that's still happening. How's COVID over there? In the U.S.? Uh -huh. Oh, they're saying it's becoming an endemic more so, but I'm getting conflicting info on whether that's like good, bad, neutral. Mm -hmm. Still high numbers though. Um, yeah, yeah, pretty high. Um, I just got an email from Zane saying that they're having uh, trouble with the hotel internet over where they're at because this is also occurring during Western Political Science Association. So. They will try to keep me posted. So I'll keep an eye on my uh, emails as that's happening. And hopefully they come in just late. All right. Well, I'll definitely keep an eye out for them. Thank you. Yes. If they enter, I'll just make them co-hosts and they can hop right in. Thank you. Okay. Now that it's 3.15, I'll let it over to you guys. I'll just be back here. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. All right. So... This is going to be a very conversational sort of round table. Um, I really wanted it to be this free flowing space where we can just talk about our own reflections on black on both sides five years on. And I'm going to do a little bit of table setting but for the most part, I'm just wanting to have a conversation and really talk through this in a way that's very open and free flowing. I really don't want there to be that deep of a demarcation between panelists and uh, audience because I do think this is an important conversation to have as many voices in as possible. Um, so I'm just going to, again, do that table sitting saying, hello everyone, and thank you for coming. I know that it's very early in the afternoon for some of us and very late in the evening for some of us. So thank you for taking your time to come out to this conversation across time zones and regions and disciplines, time and space. I really appreciate the community that we've already built up through here. So we're coming together today to discuss C. Riley Snorton's Black on Both Sides five years on, and we are lucky enough to have Professor Snorton in the room with us or in this Zoom room with us. So the way that I see it, Black on Both Sides is a truly path-breaking text, one that at least speaking for myself has changed the ways in which I approach scholarship and has influenced the trajectory of my work. Um, and I think as indicated by the multidisciplinary nature of the community that's come together today, the depth of research that Professor Snorton does within this text, is simul which is simultaneously animated by political, ethical, historical, contemporary, and future yearning imperatives, can't really be understated. So even though we are in this gathering that is ostensibly for political science, we see that a lot of us here aren't first field political scientists, and most of us might even not be first field political scientists. And I think that just speaks to the fact that even though 
this book is a gender and sexuality studies book or is itself marketed in many ways. We see so many through lines wherein um, so many communities are taking part in it, particularly as it deals with the particularism of blackness and transness and the intersection of that, right? So before we move on to our conversation, I'd like to allow our roundtable panelists to introduce themselves by briefly discussing how their work intersects or engages with Snorton's work and any initial reflections on Black on both sides five years on that they might have now that we are a little bit removed from the initial publication of it. So I can start and then I'll just go through everyone, give everyone space to just do that sort of brief reflection. Um, so in terms of my own relationship with Black on both sides, like I mentioned above, reading this book in my second year of graduate school, as it came out, really changed the trajectory of my research. And in general, I find that I've returned to this book at key moments in my graduate student um, career, if you want to call it that. First in my second year of coursework, then in my fourth year of approaching my prospectus defense. And now as I finish my time in graduate school, I'm returning to it again in this sort of in-depth, um, really close reading of it. And in this sort of space where I'm reading it in community with everyone here. And each time that I return to it, I find that there's a different thing that I'm drawn to. I have a different set of eyes and a different set of knowledges and understandings. And there's a different path that I take the take through the text, which again speaks to the richness of this text and speaks to the intellectual sort of rigor and importance of this text. And so, as I mentioned again, Snorton's political, ethical, and methodological approach to archive has served as a model for scholarship about an engagement with the stakes of studying Black trans and Black trans subjects. And to foreshadow a question that I'll be asking of the panel a little bit later or asking of everyone in the room a little bit later, this concept of still life that Snorton proposes is fundamentally important, I believe, when reading and thinking Black trans subjects to the point of I'm using it um, when writing, reading and working on this project that uh, aims towards memorialization of Lake Brockington in my own work. Um, so just to conclude my own initial responses to this or my own initial thoughts on um, reflecting on this text five years after its own publication or its initial publication, Black on Both Sides is a text that I hold very closely. When we had the big wildfires um, happening in Southern California two years ago, last year, time is funny with pandemic. It was one of the books that I said, okay, throwing this in my suitcase in case the apartment burns down. Um, and so as such, Snorton scholarship, like I've mentioned uh, before, is truly pathbreaking. And I really do look forward to discussing this with everyone today and having this sort of conversation with both folks on the panel and folks in the uh, um, audience as well. So I'm going to move on just alphabetically by last name. So Dana, would you like to speak to uh, a reflection of Black on Both Sides five years on? Thank you for having me and thank you everyone for being here. Um, okay, I'll just kind of get right into it. Um, so I'm, I consider myself like a little baby grad student, I guess. I just, I, in fact, I just finished my exams and I guess I'm officially a candidate now. Yay. Um, thank you. So I encountered this text early on in my graduate career, quite early in Tiffany's class, actually the same class that I took with um, Isabella and met Isabella in. Um, and I come from a comparative literature background. That's my field. I'm not a political scientist. Um, and so in encountering this text, I had quite a similar experience as Isabel has described, which is it was breath, a bit kind of breathtaking, to be honest. Um, for me, it was pathbreaking and all of those things. Um, in my own work, I look at Arabic literatures and I'm interested in questions of queerness and blackness and racialization and the supernatural and just kind of erotics and all these kinds of things coming together in contemporary Arabic literature and the Arab Islamic and imaginary. Um, so when I encounter kind of um, texts on race and blackness and racialization and racial categories and gendering in this part of the world, I, I'm, I'm, it becomes quite complicated for me. 
um, because the genealogies of race and blackness are simply just different where I come from, from the Middle East and kind of the geopolitical regions in which I'm invested. And so um, being an, immersed in the American Academy is, is kind of a different genealogy. And a text like this one, and for me, the magic comes in the methodology and the archival work and just the, it's just, just the incredible attention and rigor um, and, and detail. And I call it like getting your hands like real dirty um, in the archive is what I find so enriching uh, for my own work, even if I'm, I'm exploring different genealogies of, of um, a body and flesh and, and things like that in a different part of the world. Um, just coming across this text has been completely illuminating for me, especially methodologically speaking. I think it was, I don't think I've ever encountered anything like it. Um, so yes, Isabel, complete magic. And thank you so much for bringing this into our lives. And um, thank you. <laughs>
the way that we take certain kinds of narratives or historicities um, as given. And this, of course, implicates how we think about historiographic interventions and in retelling how there are certain ideas and categories of human being that arise. Uh, Storm gives us new ways to think about this. And while we've already traversed or read through this, of course, through Hartman and Spillers as terms of the afterlife of, of slavery or enslavement, I think what Snorton does is thinking of transness as a process or dynamic that's animated by the negating and dehumanizing aspects of Blackness throughout history um, is something that's novel and requires more reflection beyond the previous literature. Um, one of the lesser comments commented, or one of the lesser commented upon aspects of France Fanon's phenomenological treatise, Black Skin, White Mask, regards the expectation that anthropological typologies founded on Western man have and have accurately or adequately, or whether or not it can adequately or accurately capture and express the disjunct found between blackness and the peculiar modes of the human that are in fact responsible for the categories used to express various forms of social life. Now we often designate these as race, class, gender, queerness, disability, et cetera, are deviations from an ideal type. Uh, but what I'm interested here, particularly is Storm's conceptualization of these deviations that are markers of difference, not simply of identity, but of kind. The consequence of this description is often causal in that we suppose that the description of difference such as gender, disability, queerness uh, brings with it the violence and exclusion of that ideal type. And this is what I meant about the resituating of blackness that kind of animates dehumanization and categorization uh, is that Storton seems to tell us that there's something about the ways that trans functions within blackness and as blackness that produces these kinds of effects. Uh, Fanon suggests that reality, both psychoanalytically and sim symbolically, are given materiality within European societies. Uh, as such, the existence of Blackness in this world uh, is engineered by the desires and the signs or symbols of white humans that produce incongruence with Black life, rendered as social death and Black consciousness, rendered as the internalization of anti-Blackness or the sociogenetic principle described by Winter and drawn upon several times throughout the book by Snorton. Now, Fanon insists that, quote, Psychoanalysis, and this can't be stressed enough, sets out to understand a given behavior within a specific group represented by the family. In every case, the family is treated as the psychic object and circumstance. In Europe, the family represents the way the world reveals itself to a child. So the family structure and national structure are closely connected, end quote. This incongruence between blackness and the human that is noted by Snorton as well as Winter is a stage upon which the phenomenological duality of blackness emerges in the writing of Du Bois as double consciousness. Now explicit in Fanon's reflections is the ontogenic forms of sociality, which emerge from the peculiar species, uh, the particular species form of white humanity. But the expectation that the psychological and existential expressions of man or woman are naturally found and psychically supported in such societies is shown to be false throughout Storm's work. This expectation is not surprising given the presumed primitivity the social and psychologic aims um, intend to repress. Repression of the ethnological within the psychoanalytic modes of development, that's by Freud and by effect Spillers, conveys a symbiotic orientation that's not anticipated through Fanon. And this is where black, I think black male studies scholars would somewhat differ with Snorton's analysis of how we articulate the ontogeny of maleness or man. So the antonymic man that Snorton refers to is thought to be a projection of what Fanon describes as blackness as an exclusion from the dominant symbolics of gender, which is to say that within anti black patriarchal formulation, the black man cannot be a man, end quote. For black male studies scholars such as myself or Cameron Warren, however, the problem of the gender analytic emerges from the mistaken imposition of the phallus upon the elongated flesh of the black penis. So whereas Warren has identified the crisis of the gender analytic as the imposition of the phallus upon the black male, I have discussed this crisis as phallicism are an irreconcilable contradiction of the black male flesh as both effeminate, female, and raped, and hypermasculine, deviant, and rapist simultaneously. This distinction was commented on earlier, almost a decade earlier, by Anthony Lamel Jr. in his book, Black Masculinity and Sexual Politics, because the thesis of the book is that two contradictory cultural forces are important for structuring the black male status in the United States. The first being animalistic and hypersexual expectation, and the second, if, the second is feminine expectation. So the social function of these two organizing principles has partially been to control and possess the back male. Much of the organization of these principles consists of technologies that change throughout history, yet these contradictory expectations remain as a core mechanism communicating the black male as a key submissive status. Lamel argues that feminists frequently understand gender as related to power, 
but often overlook the dual effects of feminization and hypermasculization. And I would add here simultaneously on black males in a culture as a way to reproduce their submissive status. So through snoring, while we differ on this aspect, we certainly do agree that there is a gap between the taxonomies of gender that prescribe and identify kinds in our world and mark differences of the flesh. Blackness then animates the ability of a category like gender or sex to differentiate and lessen the flesh it is imposed upon. So for Snorin, this reflection is situated upon a reading of the Black maternal into Black masculine's existential text. Following spillers into the vestibularity of the Black female body and her capacity to reproduce race and birth the color line, as Snorin says on page 107, she as progenitor of race is the emblem of this complex, even paradoxically form of sociality. The Black mother's gender is vestibular, vestibular, a translocation marked by a capacity to reproduce objects and beings. Here there is something to remark upon given the long history within ethnology, Jim Crow, war, and genocides to exterminate the sperm and flesh of men and boys for their reproductive capacities. Uh, throughout Snorton's work, uh, there is an extraordinary attention to detail, but a, simultaneously a simultaneous retreat into the feminine as a way to explain the escape from gender and other human taxonomies. A Black male studies scholar would comment or reply that if we look towards the evolution of history or even the historicity of history as remarked upon by Snorton, that it reveals that through ethnological tropes as also all the practices of war and genocide, that the reproductive capacity of race was highly linked to that of the male, the reproductive capacities of men as well. So this would be something for us to consider and for Black male studies scholars and Snorton's work to be in conversation on and debating future literatures. As such, Snorton offers Black studies an unexpected way to think about Blackness beyond its combination with a newly emergent identity. But as a process of Blackness revealing itself to Black consciousness, this account of Blackness gives rise to an existential, perhaps more appropriately named eschatological mnemonic in Black studies that Snorton calls still life. Still life, as Snorton describes it, is an interface of survival as a form of life that exceeds life meanings and posthumous life wherein Black and trans life continues to accrue meaning after the event of death and gives expression to black and trans ghosts that persist and linger as if they are not from the past, but from the not so distant future. Snorton makes an incredibly illuminating contribution to current debates of masculinity and gender, and I think fits within the paradigm of black male studies as an invitation to rethink the lack associated with black masculinity within traditional gender theory as describing caricature rather than an actual mode of black male being. So the articulation of the man not not only tries to resist the character attributed to black male not being or nontology due to lack, but also articulate the inability of black men to be captured within humanist frames or ontological molds of gender. Uh, what I see five years out from the publication of this book is a reflection both on caricature and castration that simply reveals that there's much more collaborative and productive work to be engaged upon within future scholarships and debates uh, between these two emergent areas of study. So thank you. Okay, sorry about um, that. My laptop kind of exploded. Um, so I'm on my iPad now. Uh, so thank you for those comments, Professor Curry. We're going to go now to Kirby Lynch. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, wow, it's such an honor to be here. Um, thank you, Dr. Curry, for your comments. Um, a lot was said there, let's engage more. Um, but yeah, five years. So little context to me. My name is Dr. Kirby Lynch. I received my PhD in December 2021. I filed. Um, and, you know, that's powerful to be on this panel now because, you know, I really consider myself a Snortanian or whatever, or you say it, um, you know, because five years ago I was reading Black on both sides. I was in seminars, you know, I was actually an undergraduate student who was in graduate seminars when it first hit the street. Am I muted? Okay, am I back? Cool. Anyway, I was in the streets with it. We was all in the streets. Okay, I, I'm gonna get like a little kind of candid with it because um, it was such an important text uh, for me and my development. Um, as a scholar, so I'll speak about that. Um, so the title of my dissertation was called In the Afterlife, Tracing Black Queer Spatialities Under Regimes of Displacement. And I actually surveyed different Black queer cultural producers 
who were actually reflecting on and responding to early forms of gentrification and displacement. Um, however, their literature and works weren't really being considered uh, being studied in a lot of literature on San Francisco and gentrification. Black queer people's experiences were totally um, missing from the general narrative of gentrification in San Francisco. Um, and so that was kind of like my intervention. But really having the boldness and the audacity to make such an intervention really came from the energy of, you know, Dr. Snorton's book and, and you know, its contribution to Black queer studies at its time. Um, you know, and I also want to shout out to Dr. Richardson, who also informs, uh, you know, me with the queer limit of Black memory. So, you know, organically, just the, you know, the 2010s was a really interesting time, I think, for Black studies. I think we had just like some heavy hitters. Um, and so this text was the, the, our, our trans text, like it was it. It was like, okay, like this is our language. This is our weapon. This is our tool um, to respond back real time, especially to the, to the white dominated queer studies field um, at the time, who again, is still like a hegemonic vibe in queer studies of whiteness. And so, you know, to have such a text real time, um, give us everything we need, give us that archival evidence was just so amazing. And I think um, what Dr. Snorton just represents as a scholar is working with the taboo and is really being in the underground, even working with the concept of the down low, you know, like, you know, me being a young black person, really figuring, like I'm a first generation college student, really trying to figure out what this academic space is to have scholars like Dr. Snorton write books. It's like, I grew up on the down low. I saw them BET specials and I was there with Terry McMillan. But to actually have a scholar break it down and read our culture, because we know internally our culture really does need to talk about these taboo topics. Like that's why the work is so important. It, it's inside and outside of academia. It gave us, again, a tool inside academia to address the hegemony of white queer studies where, you know, Black folks don't have an indigenous history. We can't really talk about Afrocentrism, right? You know, this is why, you know, it's like we need to talk about our culture organically, who Black people are, right, in queer studies. C. Riley Snorton's Black on Both Sides gave us that. But then also in our community, it's powerful. You know, even just this year, the African Black Coalition which is the University of California student group, you know, they assign Black on both sides as the text for the political education, you know? Um, and that's a huge group of Black students organizing, mobilizing. And it's like, okay, no, we need to understand the complexity of Blackness and of gender and our people. Um, and so that's why I love this book um, because it's ungendering Blackness, right? And I think the most important question Snorton asks is, what is sexuality to and for the fungible on page 68? Again, the question of this book that is like awesome for me is, what is sexuality to and for the fungible? You know, what is sexuality to black, abjected, discarded, wasted folks? Like who cares about our sexuality and our interiority? And um, this book gives us a reason to. And also I wanna just shout out, I'm also a little emotional because I woke up this morning with, you know, Blake Brockington on my mind so heavy um, because that's how the book opens up with an archival preservation of Blake, you know, and being, a, um, a, a, you know, a queer person coming up in the 2000s with so much hypervisibility, again, in hella whiteness, to have the archival preservation of our Black trans young folks who are not here, right? is so important too, because it's a marker of the time. You know, the 2010s was the realization for a lot of us that, you know, um, black trans life is precious, um, it's not promised. And so um, in general, the book starts off like understanding our history is how we actually do get to have a future. So I just love the book. I appreciate being here and excited for the discussion. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. 
Um, and then moving on to our last panelist or our last official panelist, uh, Professor Matt Richardson. Oh, I just want to thank everybody who uh, was instrumental in putting you together the conference and the panel. Uh, thank you to Dr. Uh, Tiffany Willoughby Harrard for inviting me on this. And uh, it is an honor to, to speak about um, uh, Dr. Snorton's work. I, I may I may say Riley, I may slip up and just say Riley up in here. That's that's fine, you know. Um, and I and I really appreciate what people are saying about um, the the this text and um and talking about the emotion of it right because um i actually think that the uh some of the impact of dr snorton's work in black on both sides is the effective impact right um uh, of his descriptions of black life and history um we sometimes discount uh and discouraged thinking about the importance of the effective component of acti academic work. However, I don't think we should. Uh, the pedagogical importance of Snorton's text is related to its effective resonance. Um, for me, Black on both sides, uh, I, I think of it as a loving response to Hortense Spiller's foundational essay, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, an American Grammar Book. Snorton engages in a Black trans feminist dialogue with Spillers, extending uh, and investigating her arguments through examples, both literary and historical and cultural. Although I've taught the entire book, I, you know, I'm most haunted and my students um, often most engaged uh, by this section entitled Blacken. This section is an uh, amazing uh, example of Hortense Spillers' uh, famous declaration of Black bodies made flesh through the violence of the Middle Passage. Snorton investigates the corporeal register uh, to what it means to be made flesh. He describes in excruciating particulars the brutal effacement of enslaved women by the so-called father of gynecology, James Marion Sims. Sims he made his reputation on the success of his treatment for uh, vesicovaginal fistulas used enslaved uh, women as uh, in Spillers and Snorton's words, the living laboratory upon which his legacy was built. Snorton takes us in painstaking detail through Sims's own autobiography and medical notes um, through his uh, brutal violation of Lucy, Betsy, uh, and Anarka and other unnamed uh, Black women as they are bent over and across, spread apart, pushed into, cut open, and all before the days of anesthetics. Um, the discussion of Sims speaks to the persistent physical impact of racialized misogyny uh, and of Black women's bodies made sacrifice to these European and American projects, scientific or otherwise. The retelling and recontextualization of Sims' account through Spiller's theorization of Black ungendered flesh is viscerally painful to read, but it also opens up other ways to think about the making of gender uh, under the order of enslavement. Uh, for some years, scholars have thought about Spiller's discussion of ungendered to mean that gender doesn't matter. And uh, my reading of Snorton uh, suggests that he demonstrates that to be regulated to ungendered does not make gender irrelevant, but shows that Black female body has been utilized in very distinctive ways. Sims' archive serves as a materialized, quote, materialized scene of female flesh ungendered, which as Spiller's notes, quote, offers a praxis and a theory for a text for living and for dying and a method for reading both through uh, and uh, both through diverse uh, mediations, unquote. Snorton asks whether sex is possible without flesh, a question born of the consequence of, make, of taking human beings from one gendered order to another that is highly hierarchical by racialized gender and then placing them at the bottom or perhaps off the scale of that hierarchy. Snorton takes this one step further to argue that flesh can function as a capacitating structure for alternative modes of being. Using the example of the two Marys, Snorton does something that is close to my own heart to illustrate the importance in, of malleable understandings of gender uh, to an archive of Black life. What does it mean to exist in the shadows of history? 
not just any history, but the archives of transsexuality, a subject far removed from the central discourses and chronologies of histories that are familiar to most people. If I could be so bold as to paraphrase Du Bois's How Does It Feel to Be a Problem, um, uh, Snorton's text asks us to think, how does it feel to be a shadow of a shadow? The book in the discussion of the two Marys is an argument for historical expansion of the definitions of Black womanhood. Mary Jones and Mary Ann Waters, two trans feminine figures that show up in the archives of the carceral system in various ways are effectively important figures to me because of their relationship to understanding the Black past. The Black trans past is obscured by racism, homophobia, and transphobia. Black on both sides situates trans experience in the archive of Black life. It's my own personal obsession, which it seems that I share with uh, Riley, to think about Black trans ancestors and their experiences. Something that I've explored in my own work through literary criticism um, and as a novelist, especially in thinking of Black history at large, where do those ancestors belong? And according to Black on both sides, those ancestors belong right in the center of Black history. I, and I think that with all of the anti-Black, uh, anti-trans, anti-queer, uh, anti-choice legislation that is uh, just devastating many communities in this country right now, and it seems to be gaining momentum. Uh, uh, this work is absolutely crucial, and I'm, you know, kind of taking, you know, James Baldwin with me here uh, <laughs> to give uh, love to the to the work um, and to its its, it's importance in um, thinking about Black life as a whole and to kind of situating uh, a kind of trans feminist narrative in our understanding of the archive. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. These have been incredible sort of reflections just to start with. And I'm trying to be, um, mindful of time just to give folks in the audience a chance to ask any questions if you would like. So there are a lot of questions I would like to start off with, but jumping off from Professor Richardson and um, glancing upon um, what Professor Lynch offered us in terms of referring back to uh, Blake Rockington, I want to take us back to this question of the affective and this question of still life. So this concept of still life that Snorton proposes is again, this really rich way of reading, theorizing and engaging with black trans and black trans life. And I think it's ex especially um, relevant to the NCOPE's theme of this year, which is visions of black futures at a crossroads. And so in terms of thinking about this concept of still life, in terms of thinking about how you may utilize it or what the political possibilities might be for utilizing it or for theorizing it or for emphasizing this idea of still life, emphasizing this idea of even so and as yet there is still life, something that I've written so much that I have it like burned into my, my memory as a line that I just repeat very often. How can we think of both the act of affective possibilities of still life and still life as a response to perhaps the political conditions that we are moving through, the theoretical conditions that have been normalized, but also how do we think of still life as something that can be lived, something as an analytic. So just to give some context for my own work on Blake Rockington, I think of him in context with other past black trans youth um, and other past trans of color youth who made alternative worlds for themselves on Tumblr. So I think of him particularly as glancing towards this still life in his, making his own archive of this is who I am and this is how I can continue to live beyond into the future, into these lives that um, perhaps anticipated many of the commonplace debates and the reductive in many ways debates that are being circulated um, in so far as we're thinking about how there's a, a, a very, particular type of trans subject who can be um, uh, 
say, made into a seen as a political subject. I'm thinking about how he's compared to, or Brockington is often compared to Leela Alcorn more than he's compared to, say, a Mark Aguhar um, uh, figure. Both of uh, Brockington and Aguhar being trans of color people who were really at very different political places than, say, the more mainstream trans figures who we memorialize. And so that was all sort of a tangent to get into what are these political possibilities of still life, especially as we are envisioning here at NCOPES with this contemporary theme or this uh, modern theme or this yearly theme of visions of Black futures as a, at a crossroads. I think that that crossroads imagery especially is something that I'd like to bring to the fore. So that's a lot. Um, and I would just like to open the floor up to our panelists. That's a heavy question. Anybody want to go first? Uh, man. Yeah, yeah, you. You're talking. All right. I know. I <laughs> guess it's it. me. I was like, man, I was like, wow. Okay. Um, just something that immediately comes up for me when we're thinking about still life and just uh, how Dr. Snorton reads the archive. That's a nothing. That, I think that's something very particular that sh should be useful for political scientists when we're thinking about, you know, life outcomes for, you know, this particular group of people. Um, Snorton's way of reading things is very slow. You know, really, again, when I'm thinking about still life, I'm thinking about the snapshot in time Dr. Snorton is trying to put us in and doing that 360 view. So, you know, trying to answer that question, I'm thinking about even the short time that Dr. Snorton works with the swamp metaphor and how someone being in the swamp is being akin to freedom. You know, how even when you're half in water, like, you know, referring to that as a particular type of cross-dressing, you know, so that's a, that's a still life. You know, you gotta think about people waiting in the water and what that, you know, what, what that action and what they're doing actually means. Um, and that goes back to even, you know, Sylvia Winter and, you know, her decipherment method, you know, that also Jose Esteban Munoz refers to as like, you know, what are these, when people are doing these actions, what, what is the true meaning of their doing? Um, and so thinking about waiting in the water in the swamp. And again, that goes back to sovereignty, body sovereignty, um, which is like, you know, this is how a political subject is made anyway, is through that quest for sovereignty, that desire for sovereignty. So you know, I think that's so important. And we see that in Dr. Snorton's um, kind of exegesis on Ebony and the particular um, stories Ebony chose to highlight, you know, the people saying that they, you know, my life as a man for 15 years. And, you know, also those intimate uh, photographs of the person bind, binding themselves up. And I think this was like done in the 1950s. Um, so, you know, that's how a political subject is being made too, because you're looking at what they're doing and you're like, why, why do they do what they do? Maybe because their life is set up in a particular way. Maybe there's particular structures that are suppressing and oppressing them on a daily basis. So I'm, you know, when we're thinking about still life, you know, and looking at people and looking at the archive, we're also being able to project and make analysis about life outcomes for this population. And when we're thinking about black trans folks, we gotta get real about life outcomes and really have that real conversation politically. And even if the data is not there, you know, just the fact is these people are living their lives in particular ways because of the <laughs> obvious outcomes, right? And so we shouldn't be ignorant to it. We should respond accordingly. That's how I feel about it. I, yeah, that is, um, I, I really, I love that, uh, the, the specifics of that answer and all the ways that I, you know, that we should be kind of thinking about the, um, the everydayness and the, the materiality of, of Black life and, um, and how Black trans people are a part of that um, continuation and um, wholeness of Black life, right? And, I, and that's something that um, for, for me, um, 
where the the work really um, helps make this argument as we are looking, like I was saying, if you're talking about kind of the the this political moment, looking at all of these issues and all of this um, these attacks really um, as having a connection between them, right? Like as opposed to, another thing about still life is like, it, as opposed to seeing these as disparate, like, you know, the, the anti-Black history over here and the anti-trans is over there and the anti-abortion is over there. These are all like, it, you know, kind of impacting uh, us at the same time. And um, thinking about this is like, if you are going after Black trans children, you're going after a Black community, right? Uh, you're going after Black families. And therefore then it is, front it should be front and center to any kind of black political uh uh thinking organization uh both inside and outside of the academy right like now we're now we're at the core of uh as you were saying like bodily sovereignty integrity um and black people i i hope have had enough of somebody else telling us what we should do with our bodies um, I, you know, and this is exemplified. I also think about um, Mary Jones and in this text and her assertions of being like, you know, I've always just been who I am and these are my people and this is my community and this is where I live and love and work. And, uh, you know, who are you? All? Who is this court to tell me that I'm not who I am? My name is Mary Jones, right? Like, and, um, and so these uh, these investigations into into this into these archives um, uh, and it really I think gives us another picture of of black life um, and gives us uh, a you know kind of opens up like pulls back some curtains in terms of um, the complexity and um, creativity and the beauty of black life and as you know as well as um helping us understand that these are um connected uh political struggles so that's what that's how i think about this right like this this book really i mean i love i love that 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 first chapter of of really moving through uh the, the 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 ordeal of these black women slaves in order to get us to you know really thinking about um the past of of black uh uh gender and um uh in understanding what is it you know all all of the 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 forms in which you know the flesh informs sex and um such that by the time we get to to the two Marys, we understand them to to have been on a continuum with these with the with the women uh, on Sims's table, and and that is crucial, I think, to understanding how to make a response in this political moment, one that is not disconnected, but one that is connected. It's my turn. Yeah, I, th I think still, still life is a really interesting inter intervention. Um, I, I see Snorton reflecting upon something that I've seen troubled over the last decade in Black studies, which is this concept of futurity. Uh, uh, in my own work, I've, I've thought about this as, as nihility, uh, how it's limited and how normative political theory is interrupted by what we take to be tentatively the Black subject. So I think I think still life interrupts the expectation of normative political theory because the should, the ought, what can be done is arrested by the presence of blackness. Uh, if futurity is limited, um, then reproduction or progeny, the expectation that the nation state can sustain future aspirations uh, is gone, is taken away, it's abolished and eliminated. Uh, and this affects how political theory then develops through all of its modes, right? And I think this is, you know, this is where uh, the reflection upon Fanon's work in Black Skin, White Mass, uh, I think is really important. Uh, Snorton reads Fanon as making an interruption 
into how certain patterns of blackness are incompatible with taxonomic structures of white humanity. Uh, but I, but in thinking about you know the the less quoted argument about Fanon's reflection on the European family and how psychoanalysis emerges from the expectation that super ego development uh, comes alongside the development of the nation and of course the military, I think we also see that futurity is built into the ontogeny of political subjects. Uh, so I see Snorton having perhaps an unintended but nonetheless very useful. A uh, conversation with this question of progeny and futurity uh, that I think deserves more attention from political philosophers and political theorists. And I think the overlap here between Black Male Studies and Stern's reflection are very interesting because what Black Male Studies largely does in conversation with genocide studies is try to encircle the eschatological dilemma of engaging Blackness, such that when you when you tend to look at Black males, you're looking at a culmination of violence and premature death. So the eschatology of how we situate subjectivity and we start reflecting upon blackness uh, largely escapes the kind of philosophical lenses, be it phenomenological or existential, uh, because the question of what the self is or whether or not you're simply speaking or reflecting upon ghosts or specters, right, to use to use Marriott's language, um, that, that process of haunting really does animate and run through so much of, of what black literature has been from the 1900s forward. So not only is Du Bois uh, discussing what it means for blackness to be a problem, you know, as Dr. Richardson says, but there's also this question like the death of the firstborn escaping the world, right, and framed by a certain kind of misandric aggression that perhaps is better to be dead than alive. And I think still life captures that suspension or the expansion of the now, very similar to how Sylvia Winter discusses this problem uh, in No Humans Evolve and certainly how Hugh P. Newton discusses it in Revolutionary Suicide. I think that these are all reflections on the disjunct between the expectations that we have of the order of the of the universe. So there's a kind of cosmogony behind how Black people are thinking about political orientation because the expect expectation of time, the expectation of life, right, the expectation of future. These frameworks that that you know Kant is trying to situate as the you know uh, synthetic a prioris, right, space and time, you know, for for experience. Uh, don't seem to apply to, to, to Blackness, to the experience of Blackness or the conditions that allow us to have experience. So again, I think, I think that the, what, what I find personally interesting about, about this text, and you know, this is a text that, uh, that Calvin and I and uh, you know, Sawyer have discussed uh, to some extent in the past, is this attempt that I think Black Studies has from a lot of different perspectives to resituate both the symbolic orientation and kind of the social political ontologies, the social metaphysics, as we call it in our field, right, of, of what conditions are allows us to have political experience and engagement. And I think Storton's correct that we've often looked at that this in terms of life and death, right? This is what's so powerful about the end of it, you know, situating death and the transfiguration of, of trans bodies throughout time, but then also making a claim for life as an impossibility, right? Um, that That's, that's an interesting move because it, it, re, it also exists in contradiction to the rest of the text. So it may be in accepting the impossibility of black life, all forms of black life, right? Male, female, trans, et cetera, that we have to realize that this system <laughs> of discourse and paradigm simply is not made for us. It's you know, anthropologically incompatible with the kinds of designations that we have to reflect upon. And I think that becomes part of the battle and the task that previous scholars and older scholars are drawing from on a kind of gender analytic that's relying on certain kind of symbolic forms that are unveiled by Marxism, feminism, psychoanalysis, et cetera. Whereas new interventions are drawing from other forms and disciplinary historical conversations that are all that, that are in tension with one another, but still arrive at the question of how we deal with or reflect upon death. Okay, um, all of this is quite, um, it's a difficult position to follow all of those wonderful comments, especially <laughs> thinking of like where I am in my um, kind of process, which is pre-proposal. I don't even have a proposal, let alone a dissertation, let alone like this long careers. Um, <laughs> you got it, you got it. Thank you. Yeah, um, <laughs> so I've, I'm just kind of picking up, I have, I guess at this point, I have more questions than I have anything else. And so as everybody's talking in my head, it's just questions, questions, questions. Um, 
and, and trying to see things from where I stand and, and kind of the questions that I'm interested in. So, um, for example, when Dr. Lynch was talking about kind of the stillness in, in the swamp, um, I remember that particular part of the book being quite important to me too. Um, and just thinking about temporality, which everyone is obviously discussing and discussing that kind of arrested temporality, but I'm also interested in other than human temporality or non-human temporality or not human temporality or just kind of temporalities that exist outside of, you know, the kind of march towards progress that we're all drowning in. Um, and the relationship between temporality and blackness and also how that would relate to the relationship between temporality and things that are outside of the category of the human, um, because my work is interested in kind of erotic crossings between the human and the non-human or the other than human, um, and questions of where race, racial categories, blackness are situated when it comes to temporalities of the non-human. And then, um, it's just, for me, there's this, these constant questions about the rooting of this entire theoretical, political, spiritual, um, economic, just kind of genealogies of Blackness and Black flesh in plantation slavery, in the Middle Passage, in the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and so all these questions that I'm kind of struggling with is what if you're trying to theorize a Blackness or live a Blackness or just talk, speak a Blackness um, that is not rooted in those um, historical realities or those geopolitical spaces and histories and realities? Um, what if we are discussing a different Frame, completely different historical framework um, of enslavement, um, somewhere where enslavement happened completely differently and was not born of the plantation. Um, when you bring in ideas of Islamic concub concubinage and what happens when the child born of the slave woman is free, as in a lot of Islam, you know, free, <laughs> um, is just not an enslaved person. Um, what does that do to structures of kinship and crossings and body and, and, and questions like that? Um, so in these kinds of discussions, I feel like I'm kind of running around outside of these histories, trying to see what's going on in other histories and what kind of lives are being generated and lived. What is the relationship between blackness and enslavement and anti-blackness in the Arab world, in the Islamic world, in the Arab Islamic and imaginary? What other things are taking place, especially in relation to the non-human, other kinds of temporalities and crossings and like sacred worldings? Um, what is it's my constant question is what is taking place with blackness elsewhere <laughs> where, where we are not rooted in plantation kind of ungen, what kind of genderings and ungenderings are happening in these other spaces? Um, you know, the trans-Saharan slave trade centuries and centuries, 10 centuries older than um, when the Europeans and the white people came along and started doing what they do. Um, so what's, what, what was happening kind of then with the relationship between gender and blackness and race? Um, and so that's kind of what I'm trying to think about and bring to the table. And I work a lot in poetics, in the literary. So what do things like poetics do to the, to still life, um, and to, Abjection, I guess, uh, questions of if, if the abject is that which precedes language or exists outside of language, um, how, how do poetics come into play when can you have abject language other than human language, non-human language outside of the symbolic order is something I'm interested in as well. What kinds of languages and utterances and articulations of like the semiotic, for example, or just the non-human are taking place? And again, how are those related to blackness? Um, if right now we're thinking about in conversation with Snorton um, and, and others, um, how 
gender and blackness are inextricable. Um, they are co-constituted um, and the same with transness, obviously. Um, what happens off the plantation? If you are talking about a history of blackness in which the plantation economy wasn't integral to these con con constructs of race and such. Um, so any input from anyone at all um, and thinking kind of down these kinds of lines would be so wonderful to hear. I think we only have a couple more minutes left. Um, so I wanna open the floor to that question. I would also like to open the floor to any of the audience members. I would like to hear any questions that you might have, any, um, uh, con not concerns, but uh, thoughts about the book, reflections on the book for themselves, reflections on the panel um, in our sort of closing minutes before we um, say goodbye, at least for now. Hey, everybody. I just want to um, say thank you all for making time to be here today. This was kind of a, a massive, heavy lift to ask you all to do this because it requires you to speak to this audience of political scientists. And we do things in very peculiar kinds of um, often very irrelevant kind of way. <laughs> and so to, to speak um, to speak into that particular void is a very courageous and I thank you all for that. But, um, you know, when, when Isabel and Josh and Zane were thinking about this panel, um, once I caught up to where they were, because the students are always ahead of me, um, I realized it was an opportunity to just bring a love offering to Riley. Um, and that's, that's all I wanted it to be, was just a love offering and a, a thank you, a um, you know, for, for honoring us uh, with this kind of level of rigor. Um, and, you know, the book, as everyone has told you here, has meant so much to all of us personally, and also, you know, pressed us to think in really different kinds of ways, and just given us language and grammar and um, and story, uh, but it's also allowed us to be really present with um, our ancestors. Um, so uh, that's all I want to say. I don't know if you've been given a chance to to say anything, or if you feel okay about saying anything. But it's just um, we want to give you all the flowers, all the flowers, all the flowers, all the flowers. Wow! Oh wow! Um... So I, I put something in the in the chat because I did not know if I would be able to have composure to say much. Um, it feels so incredibly rare and precious to witness this kind of care and engagement. And so it's deeply, deeply felt. Um, and I, I really look forward to all kinds of conversations amongst everyone gathered in this room um, you know, I, I feel like when Isabel let me know that this was happening, I was shocked. <laughs> and, um, and I also am so deeply moved that this is called still life because it's also, it's, it's actually one of the concepts that I was most hopeful about as a, as a kind of, um, conceptual, um, offering. And so that this title that this panel is titled that is also it's a, just another level of what I see as such a an incredibly generous and completely unexpected um, uh, rigorous engagement with care and and so thank you is what I have is just profound from a deep place thanks. Anyone else before we, I mean, we are technically a minute over, but anyone else have comments, offerings, care to give? You know, I just want to say thank you, uh, Riley, for your work. And I, I want to um, say that I'm looking forward to, to many years of being in conversation with you. So much love. 
I'm glad to have been been able to be here. You the vanguard. Thanks, so yeah. <laughs> you the vanguard. Snorting for president. Thank you so oh, much what? for inviting me to the panel. <laughs> Uh, the Afro future uh, in, uh, autonomous, uh, you know, third world nation over there. You already know. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Appreciate you all so much. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye bye.